So basically, we see this word that Paul said is profitable and is, is to be used in our life. We see it at work. And, and over the last two weeks, we've seen that. In Joseph's life, he had a life filled with stress, and God's word protected him. Now, what about us? Do we see the stress of our life as the Lord testing us? You see, anything that's out of control, if, if stress in our life makes us anxious, that part of our life is not under God's control. The way you measure whether your life is under God's control is if it's out of control, it's not under God's control. If your appetite is out of control, it's not under God's control. If your finances are out of control, they're not being controlled by God. Anything God controls, he's refining and shaping for his glory. Doesn't mean we're happy and rich like all those people I just talked to. But it means that we have surrendered our life to be what God designed us to be. And then we saw that about the dangers of life. We went through David's life. He had a, a dangerous life. Do you know what most people struggle with? What, what did Jesus say most not to do? He said, fear not. David had every reason to fear. But God, the scriptures say, does not dispense a spirit of fear. And if you believe God, there are only two sources of motivation in the world. There's the God of the universe, the infinite and almighty, ever-living God of truth. And then there's the evil one that the whole world lies in his lap. And everyone is born into this world walking according to the course of the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience all around us. And that's how we were born. We were born children of our father, the devil. And when we're born again, we go into the only other family that's possible. Everyone in the world is either lost, that's how we're born, or through calling on the name of the Lord, saved. There's only two kinds of people in the world, lost and saved. Those that have the son and those that do not. And God does not give a spirit of fear. That's from the God of this world. That's why Jesus said most frequently, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. Then we went through and looked at Paul's affliction-filled life. And what we saw is, and this was my last message to him, it was such a blessing. I said, did you know that people can live 40 days without food? And some of you would do well to do that for a while. Uh, you know what I mean, you know, the whole diet thing. And you can go about four days without water. And we can go about four minutes without air but people can't go for more than a few moments without hope. And you and I are supposed to be like fountains of hope. You know what Paul said? Whatever things were written before were written. What is he talking about? He's talking about the Old Testament. That's the, the Bible he studied and the Bible he taught from. And he says all of that scripture, those 39 books, were written for our learning not for our toting, that we would get to know them, that we would learn about the God that's in the pages, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, when we read the scriptures, they produce patience and comfort. People in our world are very impatient and very uncomfortable and restless and hopeless and endlessly looking for something else. Amazing. And that all produces hope. We're supposed to be planted in life as these little, we're like cell phone towers. We're radiating a signal of hope. And, and the closer people get to us, the bars increase. And finally they're saying, boy, you're not, you're not worried about all that? You know? You go, no, I mean, I'm, you know, have to pay my bills and live and you know, get sick and everything else and go through life. But no, I'm not. I have hope. And you start pointing him. I, I actually have citizenship. I already have reservations in heaven. I know I'm going there. And they'll back away. They're not interested in that. But they'll come back. Because people, when they see our afflictions and they see our hope, they can't understand it. And we went through that. And then we went through the tragedy-filled life of, of Jeremiah. And look what Jeremiah said. He said, I read the Bible. Your words were found. But I didn't just read it. I ate it. Whatever you ate last night, 
has started going to the molecular level of your body right now. It's actually become part of you. What part of this book did you eat in the last 24 hours that's starting to become at the very cellular level of your Christian existence part of you? That's what I'm talking about this morning. We are supposed to be asking each other, what are you eating? What are you eating? And is that word you're eating becoming to you joy and rejoicing in your innermost being because it helps you know a little more every day that you belong to the God of the universe? Every day, we are a little more tied to where we're going and a little less tied. That's why we're called tent dwellers. Paul and Peter both said they lived in life in a tent. They were sojourners, pilgrims, strangers. When people look at your life, do they think you're strange because you don't seem to be going the same direction as they are? If you're headed toward heaven and they're not, you're not going in the same direction. But if they're not aware that you're not going in the same direction, you're not eating and the word is not doing its work inside of you. Because we are considered to be strangers to them. Remember, citizens of heaven, earth dwellers. Do they see that you're primarily attached to this life, this job, this body, as much as you can get and hold on to and show off, or to heaven? And the Holy Spirit makes us self-sacrificing.